While sailing in the Arctic, the pole star becomes trapped in ice. But when superstition begins to run rampant among the crew, the captain begins to cope in a strange way. Arthur Conan Doyle, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to this vintage episode of the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. A new vintage episode is released every Tuesday. New content will be available every Friday. Please help us to keep the lights on by going to classictalesaudiobooks.com and becoming a supporter. Thank you so much. While mostly famous for his creation of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle enjoyed crafting tales about the supernatural as well. The Captain of the Pole Star and Other Tales includes many great pieces of short fiction in this vein. And now, The Captain of the Pole Star by Arthur Conan Doyle. September 11th. Latitude 81 degrees 40 minutes north. Longitude 2 degrees east. Still lying to amid enormous ice fields. The one which stretches away to the north of us, and to which our ice anchor is attached, cannot be smaller than an English county. To the right and left, unbroken sheets extend to the horizon. This morning the mate reported that there were signs of pack ice to the southward. Should this form of sufficient thickness to bar our return, we shall be in a position of danger, as the food, I hear, is already running somewhat short. It is late in the season, and the nights are beginning to reappear. This morning I saw a star twinkling just over the foreyard, the first since the beginning of May. There is considerable discontent among the crew, many of whom are anxious to get back home and to be in time for the herring season, when labor always commands a high price upon the Scotch coast. As yet their displeasure is only signified by sullen countenances and black looks, but I heard from the second mate this afternoon that they contemplated sending a deputation to the captain to explain their grievance. I much doubt how he will receive it, as he is a man of fierce temper, and very sensitive about anything approaching to an infringement of his rights. I shall venture after dinner to say a few words to him upon the subject. I have always found that he will tolerate from me what he would resent from any other member of the crew. Amsterdam Island, at the northwest corner of Spitzbergen, is visible upon our starboard quarter, a rugged line of volcanic rocks intersected by white seams which represent glaciers. It is curious to think that at the present moment there is probably no human being nearer to us than the Danish settlements in the south of Greenland, a good nine hundred miles as the crow flies. A captain takes great responsibility upon himself when he risks his vessel under such circumstances. No whaler has remained in these latitudes till so advanced a period of the year. 9 p.m. I have spoken to Captain Craigie, and though the result has been hardly satisfactory, I am bound to say that he listened to what I had to say very quietly and even deferentially. When I had finished, he put on that air of iron determination, which I have frequently observed upon his face, and paced rapidly backward and forward across the narrow cabin for some minutes. At first, I feared that I had seriously offended him. But he dispelled the idea by sitting down again and putting his hand upon my arm with a gesture which almost amounted to a caress. There was a depth of tenderness, too, in his wild, dark eyes, which surprised me considerably. Look here, doctor, he said. I'm sorry I ever took you. I am indeed. And I would give fifty pounds this minute to see you standing safe upon the Dundee Quay. It's hit or miss with me this time. There are fish to the north of us. How dare you shake your head, sir, when I tell you I saw them blowing from the masthead! This in a sudden burst of fury, though I was not conscious of having shown any signs of doubt. 
Two and twenty feet in as many minutes as I am a living man, and not one under ten feet. Now, Doctor, do you think I can leave the country where there is only one infernal strip of ice between me and my fortune? If it came on to blow from the north tomorrow, we could fill the ship and be away before the frost could catch us. If it came on to blow from the south, I will... I suppose the men are paid for risking their lives, and as for myself, it matters but little to me, for I have more to bind me to the other world than to this one. I confess that I am sorry for you, though. I wish I had old Angus Tate, who was with me last voyage, for he was a man that would never be missed, and you. You said once that you were engaged, did you not? Yes, I answered snapping the spring of the locket which hung from my watch-chain and holding up the little vignette of Flora. "'Curse you!' he yelled, springing out of his seat with his very beard bristling with passion. "'What is your happiness to me? What have I to do with her that you must dangle her photograph before my eyes?' I almost thought that he was about to strike me in the frenzy of his rage. But with another imprecation he dashed open the door of the cabin and rushed out upon deck leaving me considerably astonished at his extraordinary violence. It is the first time that he has ever shown me anything but courtesy and kindness. I can hear him pacing excitedly up and down overhead as I write these lines. I should like to give a sketch of the character of this man, but it seems presumptuous to attempt such a thing upon paper, when the idea in my own mind is at best a vague and uncertain one. Several times I have thought that I grasped the clue which might explain it, but only to be disappointed by his presenting himself in some new light which would upset all my conclusions. It may be that no human eye but my own shall ever rest upon these lines, yet as a psychological study I shall attempt to leave some record of Captain Nicholas Craigie. A man's outer case generally give some indication of the soul within. The captain is tall and well-formed, with dark, handsome face, and a curious way of twitching his limbs, which may arise from nervousness, or be simply an outcome of his excessive energy. His jaw and whole cast of countenance are manly and resolute, but the eyes are the distinctive feature of his face. They are of the very darkest hazel, bright and eager, with a singular mixture of recklessness in their expression, and of something else, which I have sometimes thought was more allied with horror than any other emotion. Generally the former predominated, but on occasions, and more particularly when he was thoughtfully inclined, the look of fear would spread and deepen until it imparted a new character to his whole countenance. It is at these times that he is most subject to tempestuous fits of anger, and he seems to be aware of it, for I have known him to lock himself up so that no one might approach him until his dark hour was past. He sleeps badly, and I have heard him shouting during the night, but his cabin is some little distance from mine, and I could never distinguish the words which he said. This is one phase of his character, and the most disagreeable one. It is only through my close association with him, thrown together as we are, day after day, that I have observed it. Otherwise he is an agreeable companion, well-read and entertaining, and as gallant a seaman as ever trod a deck. I shall not easily forget the way in which he handled the ship when we were caught by a gale among the loose ice at the beginning of April. I have never seen him so cheerful and even hilarious as he was that night, as he paced backward and forward upon the bridge amid the flashing of the lightning and the howling of the wind. He has told me several times that the thought of death is a pleasant one to him, which is a sad thing for a young man to say. He cannot be much more than thirty, though his hair and moustache are already slightly grizzled. Some great sorrow must have overtaken him and blighted his whole life. Perhaps I should be the same if I lost my flora. Oh, 
God knows. I think if it were not for her, that I should care very little whether the wind blew from the north or the south tomorrow. There, I hear him come down the companion, and he has locked himself up in his room, which shows that he is still in an unamiable mood. And so to bed, as old Peppies would say, for the candle is burning low. We have to use them now since the nights are closing in, and the steward has turned in so there are no hopes of another one. September 12th. Calm, clear day, and still lying in the same position. What wind there is comes from the southeast, but it is very slight. The captain is in a better humor, and apologized to me at breakfast for his rudeness. He still looks somewhat distrait, however, and retains that wild look in his eyes, which in a Highlander would mean that he was a fay, at least so our chief engineer remarked to me. And he has some reputation among the Celtic portion of our crew as a seer and expounder of omens. It is strange that superstition should have obtained such mastery over this hard-hearted and practical race. I could not have believed to what an extent it is carried had I not observed it for myself. We have had a perfect epidemic of it this voyage, until I have felt inclined to serve out rations of sedatives and nerve tonics with a Saturday allowance of grog. The first symptom of it was that, shortly after leaving Shetland, the men at the wheel used to complain that they heard plaintive cries and screams in the wake of the ship, as if something were following it and were unable to overtake it. This fiction had been kept up during the whole voyage, and on dark nights at the beginning of the seal fishing it was only with great difficulty that men could be induced to do their spell. No doubt what they heard was either the creaking of the rudder chains or the cry of some passing seabird. I have been fetched out of bed several times to listen to it, but I need hardly say that I was never able to distinguish anything unnatural. The men, however, are so absurdly positive upon the subject that it is hopeless to argue with them. I mentioned the matter to the captain once, but to my surprise he took it very gravely and indeed seemed to be considerably disturbed by what I told him. I should have thought that he, at least, would have been above such vulgar delusions. All this disquisition upon superstition leads me up to the fact that Mr. Manson, our second mate, saw a ghost last night, or at least says that he did, which, of course, is the same thing. It is quite refreshing to have some new topic of conversation, after the eternal routine of bears and whales which has served us for so many months, Manson swears the ship is haunted, and that he would not stay in her a day if he had any other place to go. Indeed, the fellow is honestly frightened, and I had to give him some chloral and bromide of potassium this morning to steady him down. He seemed quite indignant when I suggested that he had been having an extra glass the night before, and I was obliged to pacify him by keeping as grave a countenance as possible during his story, which he certainly narrated in a very straightforward and matter-of-fact way. I was on the bridge, he said, about four bells in the middle watch, when the night was at its darkest. There was a bit of a moon, but the clouds were blowing across it so that you couldn't see far from the ship. John McLeod, the harpooner, came aft from the forecastle head and reported a strange noise on the starboard bow. I went forward, and we both heard it, sometimes like a bear and crying, and sometimes like a wench in pain. I've been seventeen years to the country, and I never heard a seal, old or young, make a sound like that. As we were standing there on the forecastle head, the moon came out from behind a cloud, and we both saw a sort of white figure moving across the ice field in the same direction that we had heard the cries. We lost sight of it for a while, but it came back on the port bow, and we could just make it out like a shadow on the ice. I sent a hand aft for the rifles, and MacLeod and I went down on to the pack, thinking that 
maybe it might be a bear. When we got on the ice, I lost sight of MacLeod, but I pushed on in the direction where I could still hear the cries. I followed them for maybe a mile more, and then, running around a hummock, I came right on to the top of it, standing and waiting for me, seemingly. I don't know what it was. It wasn't a bear, anyway. It was tall and white and straight. And if it wasn't a man or woman, I'll stake my davy it was something worse. I made for the ship as hard as I could run, and precious glad I was to find myself aboard. I signed articles to do my duty by the ship, and on the ship I'll stay, but you don't catch me on the ice again after sundown. That is his story, given as far as I can in his own words. I fancy what he must, in spite of his denial, have been a young bear, erect upon its hind legs, an attitude which they often assume when alarmed. In the uncertain light, this would bear a resemblance to a human figure, especially to a man whose nerves were already somewhat shaken. Whatever it may have been, the occurrence is unfortunate, for it has produced a most unpleasant effect upon the crew. Their looks are more sullen than before, and their discontent more open. The double grievance of being debarred from the herring fishing and of being detained in what they choose to call a haunted vessel may lead them to do something rash. Even the harpooners, who are the oldest and steadiest among them, are joining in the general agitation. Apart from this absurd outbreak of superstition, things are looking rather more cheerful. The pack which was forming to the south of us has partly cleared away, and the water is so warm as to lead me to believe that we are lying in one of those branches of the Gulf Stream, which run up between Greenland and Spitsbergen. There are numerous small medusae and sea lemons about the ship, with abundance of shrimps, so that there is every possibility of fish being sighted. Indeed, one was seen blowing about dinner-time, but in such a position that it was impossible for the boats to follow it. September 13th Had an interesting conversation with the chief mate, Mr. Milne, upon the bridge. It seems that our captain is as great an enigma to the seamen, and even to the owners of the vessel, as he has been to me. Mr. Milne tells me that when the ship is paid off, upon returning from a voyage, Captain Craigie disappears, and is not seen again until the approach of another season, when he walks quietly into the office of the company and asks whether his services will be required. He has no friend in Dundee, nor does anyone pretend to be acquainted with his early history. His position depends entirely upon his skill as a seaman and the name for courage and coolness which he has earned in the capacity of mate before being trusted with a separate command. The unanimous opinion seems to be that he is not a Scotchman, and that his name is an assumed one. Mr. Mill thinks that he has devoted himself to whaling simply for the reason that it is the most dangerous occupation which he could select, and that he courts death in every possible manner. He mentions several instances of this, one of which is rather curious if true. It seems that on one occasion he did not put in an appearance at the office, and a substitute had to be selected in his place. That was the time of the last Russian and Turkish war. When he turned up again next spring, he had a puckered wound in the side of his neck, which he used to endeavor to conceal with his cravat. Whether the mate's inference that he had been engaged in the war is true or not, I cannot say. It was certainly a strange coincidence. The wind is veering round in an easterly direction, but is still very slight. I think the ice is lying closer than it did yesterday. As far as the eye can reach, on every side there is one wide expanse of spotless white, only broken by an occasional rift or the dark shadow of a hummock. To the south there is the narrow lane of blue water, which is our sole means of escape, and which is closing up every day. Our captain is taking a heavy responsibility upon himself. I hear the tank of potatoes has been finished, and even the biscuits are running short, but he preserves the same impassable countenance 
and spends the greater part of the day at the crow's nest, sweeping the horizon with his glass. His manner is very variable, and he seems to avoid my society. But there has been no repetition of the violence which he showed the other night. 7.30 p.m. My deliberate opinion is that we are commanded by a madman. Nothing else can account for the extraordinary vagaries of Captain Craigie. It is fortunate that I have kept this journal of our voyage, as it will serve to justify us in case we have to put him under any sort of restraint, a step which I should only consent to as a last resource. Curiously enough, it was he himself who suggested lunacy and not mere eccentricity as the secret of his strange conduct. He was standing upon the bridge about an hour ago, peering as usual through his glass, while I was walking up and down the quarter-deck. The majority of the men were below with their tea, for the watches have not been regularly kept of late. Tired of walking, I leaned against the bulwarks and admired the mellow glow cast by the sinking sun upon the great ice-fields which surround us. I was suddenly aroused from my reverie into which I had fallen by a hoarse voice at my elbow, and starting round, I found that the captain had descended and was standing by my side. He was staring out over the ice with an expression in which horror, surprise, and something approaching to joy were contending for the mastery. In spite of the cold, great drops of perspiration were coursing down his forehead. He was evidently fearfully excited. His limbs twitched like those of a man upon the verge of an epileptic fit, and the lines about his mouth were drawn and hard. Look! he gasped, seizing me by the wrist, but still keeping his eyes upon the distant ice, and moving his head slowly in a horizontal direction, as if following the object which was moving across the field of vision. Look! There, man! There! Between the hummocks! Now coming out from behind the far one! You see her! You must see her! There still! Flying from me! My God! Flying from me! And gone. He uttered the last two words in a whisper of concentrated agony which shall never fade from my remembrance. Clinging to the ratlines, he endeavored to climb upon the top of the bulwarks as if in the hope of obtaining a last glance at the departing object. His strength was not equal to the attempt, however, and he staggered back against the saloon skylights, where he leaned, panting and exhausted. His face was so livid that I expected him to become unconscious, so lost no time in leading him down the companion and stretching him upon one of the sofas in the cabin. I then poured him out some brandy, which I held to his lips, and which had a wonderful effect upon him, bringing the blood back into his white face and steadying his poor shaking limbs. He raised himself up upon his elbow, and looking round to see that we were alone, he beckoned to me to come and sit beside him. You saw it, didn't you? He said, still in the same subdued, awesome tone, so foreign to the nature of the man. No, I saw nothing. His head sunk back upon the cushions. No, he wouldn't without the glass, he murmured. He couldn't. It was the glass that showed her to me, and then the eyes of love. The eyes of love. I say, Doc, don't let the steward in. He'll think I'm mad. Just bolt the door, will you? I rose and did what he had commanded. He lay quiet for a while lost in thought, apparently, and then raised himself up upon his elbow again and asked for some more brandy. You don't think I am, do you, Doc? He asked as I was putting the bottle back into the after-locker. Tell me now, as man to man, do you think that I am mad? I think that you have something on your mind, I answered, which is exciting you and doing you a good deal of harm. Right there, lad, he cried, his eyes sparkling from the effects of the brandy. Plenty on my mind. Plenty. But I can work out the latitude and the longitude, and I can handle my sextant and manage my logarithms. You couldn't prove me mad in a court of law, could you now? 
It was curious to hear the man lying back and coolly arguing out the question of his own sanity. Perhaps not, I said. But still, I think you would be wise to get home as soon as you can and settle down to a quiet life for a while. Get home, eh? he muttered with a sneer upon his face. One word for me and two for yourself, lad. Settle down with Flora. Pretty little Flora. Are bad dreams signs of madness? Sometimes, I answered. What else? What would be the first symptoms? Pains in the head, noises in the ears, flashes before the eyes, delusions. Ah, what about them? He interrupted. What do you call a delusion? Seeing a thing which is not there as a delusion. But she was there, he groaned to himself. She was there. And rising, he unbolted the door and walked with slow and uncertain steps to his own cabin, where I have no doubt that he will remain until tomorrow morning. His system seems to have received a terrible shock, whatever it may have been that he imagined himself to have seen. The man himself becomes a greater mystery every day, though I fear that the solution which he has himself suggested is the correct one, and that his reason is affected. I do not think that a guilty conscience has anything to do with his behavior. The idea is a popular one among the officers, and, I believe, the crew. But I have seen nothing to support it. He has not the air of a guilty man, but of one who has had terrible usage at the hands of fortune, and who should be regarded as a martyr rather than a criminal. The wind is veering around to the south tonight. God help us if it blocks that narrow pass which is our only road to safety. Situated as we are on the edge of the main Arctic pack, or the barrier, as it is called by the whalers, any wind from the north has the effect of shredding out the ice around us and allowing our escape while the wind from the south blows up all the loose ice behind us and hems us in between two packs. God help us, I say again. September 14th, Sunday, and a day of rest. My fears have been confirmed that the thin strip of blue water has disappeared from the southward. Nothing but the great motionless ice fields around us, and their weird hummocks and fantastic pinnacles. There is a deathly silence over their wide expanse, which is horrible. No lapping of the waves now, no cries of seagulls or straining of sails, but one deep, universal silence, in which the murmurs of the seamen and the creak of their boots upon the white, shining deck seem discordant and out of place. Our only visitor was an arctic fox, a rare animal upon the pack, though common enough upon the land. He did not come near the ship, however, but after surveying us from a distance, fled rapidly across the ice. This was curious conduct, as they generally know nothing of man, and being of an inquisitive nature, become so familiar that they are easily captured. Incredible as it may seem, even this little incident produced a bad effect upon the crew. Yon poor beast he kens mair, I and sees mair no you nor me, was the comment of one of the leading harpooners, and the others nodded their acquiescence. It is vain to attempt to argue against such puerile superstition. They have made up their minds that there is a curse upon the ship, and nothing will ever persuade them to the contrary. The captain remained in seclusion all day, except for about half an hour in the afternoon, when he came out upon the quarter-deck. I observed that he kept his eye fixed upon the spot where the vision of yesterday had appeared, and was quite prepared for another outburst, but none such came. He did not seem to see me, although I was standing close behind him. Divine service was read as usual by the chief engineer. It is a curious thing that in whaling vessels the Church of England prayer book is always employed, although there is never a member of that church among either officers or crew. Our men are all Roman Catholics or Presbyterians, the former predominating. 
since a ritual is used which is foreign to both, neither can complain that the other is preferred to them. And they listen with all attention and devotion, so that the system has something to recommend it. A glorious sunset, which made the great fields of ice look like a lake of blood. I have never seen a finer and at the same time more weird effect. The wind is veering round. If it will blow twenty-four hours from the north, all will yet be well. September 15th. Today is Flora's birthday. Dear lass, it is well that she cannot see her boy, as she used to call me, shut up among the ice fields with a crazy captain and a few weeks' provisions. No doubt she scans the shipping list and the Scotsman every morning to see if we are reported from Shetland. I have set an example to the men, and look cheery and unconcerned. But God knows, my heart is very heavy at times. The thermometer is at nineteen Fahrenheit today. There is but little wind, and what there is comes from an unfavorable quarter. The captain is in an excellent humor. I think he imagines he has seen some other omen or vision, poor fellow, during the night, for he came into my room early in the morning, and stooping down over my bunk, whispered, It wasn't a delusion, Doc. It's all right. After breakfast, he asked me to find out how much food was left, which the second mate and I proceeded to do. It is even less than we had expected. Forward, they have half a tank of biscuits, three barrels of salt meat, and a very limited supply of coffee beans and sugar. In the afterhold and lockers, there are a good many luxuries, such as tinned salmon, soups, haricot mutton, etc., but they will go a very short way among a crew of fifty men. There are two barrels of flour in the storeroom and an unlimited supply of tobacco. Altogether, there is about enough to keep the men on half rations for eighteen or twenty days, certainly not more. When we reported the state of things to the captain, he ordered all hands to be piped and addressed them from the quarter-deck. I never saw him to better advantage. With his tall, well-knit figure and dark, animated face, he seemed a man born to command, and he discussed the situation in a cool, sailor-like way, which showed that, while appreciating the danger, he had an eye for every loophole of escape. "'My lads,' he said, "'no doubt you think I brought you into this fix, if it is a fix, and maybe some of you feel bitter against me on account of it. But you must remember that for many a season no ship that comes to the country has brought in as much oil money as the Pole Star, and every one of you has had his share of it. You can leave your wives behind you in comfort while other poor fellows come back to find their lasses on the parish. If you have to thank me for the one, you have to thank me for the other, and we may call it quits. We've tried a bold venture this time. We've tried a bold venture before this and succeeded. And now that we've tried one and failed, we've no cause to cry about it. If the worst comes to worst, we can make the land across the ice and lay in a stock of seals which will keep us alive through the spring. It won't come to that, though. For you'll see the Scotch coast again before three weeks are out. At present, every man must go on half rations. Share and share alike, and no favor to any. Keep up your hearts, and you'll pull through this as you've pulled through many a danger before. These few simple words of his had a wonderful effect upon the crew. His former unpopularity was forgotten, and the old harpooner, whom I have already mentioned for his superstition, led off three cheers which were heartily joined in by all hands. September 16th. The wind has veered round to the north during the night, and the ice shows some symptoms of opening out. The men are in good humor, in spite of the short allowance upon which they have been placed. Steam is kept up in the engine room, that there may be no delay should an opportunity for escape present itself. The captain is in exuberant spirits, though he still retains that wild fay expression which I have already remarked upon. This burst of cheerfulness puzzles me more than his former gloom. I cannot understand it. 
I think I mentioned in an early part of this journal that one of his oddities is that he never permits any person to enter his cabin, but insists upon making his own bed, such as it is, and performing every other office for himself. To my surprise, he handed me the key today, and requested me to go down there and take the time by his chronometer, while he measured the altitude of the sun at noon. It was a bare little room, containing a washing-stand and a few books, but little else in the way of luxury, except some pictures upon the walls. The majority of these are small, cheap oleographs, but there was one watercolour sketch of the head of a young lady which arrested my attention. It was evidently a portrait, and not one of those fancy types of female beauty which sailors particularly affect. No artist could have evolved from his own mind such a mixture of character and weakness. The languid, dreamy eyes with their drooping lashes and the broad, low brow, unruffled by thought or care, were in strong contrast with the clean-cut, prominent jaw and the resolute set of the lower lip. Underneath it, in one of the corners, was written M.B. at nineteen. That any one, in the short space of nineteen years of existence, could develop such strength of will as was stamped upon her face, seemed to me at the time to be well-nigh incredible. She must have been an extraordinary woman. Her features have thrown such a glamour over me that, though I had but a fleeting glance at them, I could, were I a draftsman, reproduce them line for line upon this page of the journal. I wonder what part she played in our captain's life. He has hung her picture at the end of his berth, so that his eyes continually rest upon it. Were he a less reserved man, I should make some remark upon the subject. Of the other things in his cabin there was nothing worthy of mention, uniform coats, a camp-stool, small looking-glass, tobacco-box, and numerous pipes, including an oriental hookah, which, by the by, gives some colour to Mr. Milne's story about his participation in the war, though the connection may seem rather a distant one. 11.20 p.m. Captain has just gone to bed after a long and interesting conversation on general topics. When he chooses, he can be a most fascinating companion, being remarkably well-read, and having the power of expressing his opinion forcibly, without appearing to be dogmatic. I hate to have my intellectual toes trod upon. He spoke about the nature of the soul, and sketched out the views of Aristotle and Plato upon the subject in a masterly manner. He seems to have a leaning for metempsychosis and the doctrines of Pythagoras. In discussing them, we touched upon modern spiritualism, and I made some joking allusion to the impostures of Slade, upon which, to my surprise, he warned me most impressively against confusing the innocent with the guilty, and argued that it would be as logical to brand Christianity as an error because Judas, who professed that religion, was a villain. He shortly afterward bid me good night, and retired to his room. The wind is freshening up, and blows steadily from the north. The nights are as dark now as they are in England. I hope tomorrow may set us free from our frozen fetters. September 17th. The bogey again. Thank heavens that I have strong nerves. The superstition of these poor fellows and the circumstantial accounts which they give, with the utmost earnestness and self-conviction, would horrify any man not accustomed to their ways. There are many versions of the matter, but the sum total of them all is that something uncanny has been flitting round the ship all night, and that Sandy MacDonald of Peterhead and Lang Peter Williamson of Shetland saw it, as also did Mr. Milne on the bridge. So, having three witnesses, they can make a better case of it than the second mate did. I spoke to Milne after breakfast, and told him that he should be above nonsense, and that, as an officer, he ought to set the men a better example. He shook his weather-beaten head ominously, but answered with characteristic caution, Maybe I, and maybe nay, doctor, he said. I didn't a kite a ghost. I cannot say I preen my faith and sea bogles and the like. 
Though there's the money as claims to as seen o' that and war. I'm no easy feared, but maybe your iron blood would run a bit cold, man, if instead of spearing about in the daylight you were with me last night and seeing awful like sheep, white and gruesome, whilst here, whilst there, and it greeting and calling in the darkness like a bit lamby that I lost his mother. You wouldn't a be so ready to put it a doon to old wives' clavers then, I'm thinking. I saw it was hopeless to reason with him, so contented myself with begging him, as a personal favour, to call upon me the next time the spectre appeared, a request to which he acceded with many ejaculations expressive of his hopes that such an opportunity might never arise. As I had hoped, the white desert behind us has become broken by many thin streaks of water, which intersect it in all directions. Our latitude today was fifty degrees fifty-two minutes north, which shows that there is a strong southerly drift upon the pack. Should the wind continue favourable, it will break up as rapidly as it formed. At present, we can do nothing but smoke and wait and hope for the best. I am rapidly becoming a fatalist. When dealing with such uncertain factors as wind and ice, a man can be nothing else. Perhaps it was the wind and sand of the Arabian deserts which gave the minds of the original followers of Muhammad their tendency to bow to kismet. These spectral alarms had a very bad effect upon the captain. I feared that they might excite his sensitive mind and endeavor to conceal the absurd story from him, but unfortunately he overheard one of the men making an allusion to it and insisted upon being informed about it, as I had expected. It brought out all his latent lunacy in an exaggerated form. I can hardly believe that this is the same man who discoursed philosophy last night with the most critical acumen and coolest judgment. He is pacing backward and forward upon the quarter-deck, like a caged tiger, stopping now and again to throw out his hands with a yearning gesture and stare impatiently out over the ice. He keeps up a continual mutter to himself, and once he called out, But a little time, love, but a little time. Poor fellow. It is sad to see a gallant seaman and accomplished gentleman reduced to such a pass, and to think that imagination and delusion can cow a mind to which real danger was but the salt of life. Was ever a man in such a position as I, between a demented captain and a ghost-seeing mate? I sometimes think I am the only real sane man aboard the vessel, except perhaps the second engineer, who is a kind of rumiant and would care nothing for all the fiends of the Red Sea so long as they would leave him alone and not disarrange his tools. The ice is still opening rapidly, and there is every probability of our being able to make a start tomorrow morning. They will think I am inventing when I tell them at home all the strange things that have befallen me. 12 p.m. I have been a good deal startled, though I feel steadier now, thanks to a stiff glass of brandy. I am hardly myself yet, however, as this handwriting will testify. The fact is that I have gone through a very strange experience, and am beginning to doubt whether I was justified in branding everyone on board as madmen, because they profess to have seen things which did not seem reasonable to my understanding. I am a fool to let such a trifle unnerve me. And yet, coming as it does, after all these alarms it has an additional significance for I cannot doubt either Mr. Manson's story or that of the mate now that I have experienced that which I used formerly to scoff at. After all, it was nothing very alarming, a mere sound, and that was all. I cannot expect that anyone reading this, if anyone ever should read it, will sympathize with my feelings or realize the effect which it produced upon me at the time. Supper was over. 
and I had gone on deck to have a quiet pipe before turning in. The night was very dark, so dark that standing under the quarter boat, I was unable to see the officer upon the bridge. I think I have already mentioned the extraordinary silence which prevails in these frozen seas. In other parts of the world, be they ever so barren, there is some slight vibration of the air, some faint hum, be it from the distant haunts of men, or from the leaves of the trees, or the wings of the birds, or even the faint rustle of the grass that covers the ground. One may not actively perceive the sound, and yet, if it were withdrawn, it would be missed. It is only here, in these arctic seas, that stark, unfathomable stillness obtrudes itself upon you in all its gruesome reality. You find your tympanum straining to catch some little murmur, and dwelling eagerly upon every accidental sound within the vessel. In this state, I was leaning against the bulwarks. When there arose from the ice, almost directly underneath me, a cry, sharp and shrill upon the silent air of the night, beginning, as it seemed to me, at a note such as prima donna never reached, and mounting from that ever higher and higher, until it culminated in a long wail of agony, which might have been the last cry of a lost soul. The ghastly scream is still ringing in my ears. Grief, unutterable grief, seemed to be expressed in it, and a great longing. And yet, through it all, there was an occasional wild note of exultation. It shrilled out from close behind me, and yet, as I glared into the darkness, I could discern nothing. I waited some little time, but without hearing any repetition of the sound, so I came below, more shaken than I have ever been in my life before. As I came down the companion, I met Mr. Milne, coming up to relieve the watch. Well, doctor, he said, maybe that's old wife's claver's talk. Did you hear it, Skirtling? Maybe that's a superstition. What do you think ought new? I was obliged to apologize to the honest fellow, and acknowledge that I was as puzzled by it as he was. Perhaps tomorrow things may look different. At present, I dare hardly write all that I think. Reading it again in days to come, when I have shaken off all these associations, I should despise myself for having been so weak. September 18th. Passed a restless and uneasy night, still haunted by that strange sound. The captain does not look as if he had had much repose either, for his face is haggard and his eyes bloodshot. I have not told him of my adventure last night, nor shall I. He is already restless and excited, standing up, sitting down, and apparently utterly unable to keep still. A fine lead appeared in the pack this morning, as I had expected, and we were able to cast off our ice anchor and steam about twelve miles in a west southwesterly direction. We were then brought to a halt by a great flow as massive as any which we have left behind us. It bars our progress completely, so we can do nothing but anchor again and wait until it breaks up, which it will probably do within twenty-four hours if the wind holds. Several bladder-nosed seals were seen swimming in the water, and one was shot, an immense creature more than eleven feet long. They are fierce, pugnacious animals, and are said to be more than a match for a bear. Fortunately, they are slow and clumsy in their movements so there is little danger in attacking them upon the ice. The captain evidently does not think we have seen the last of our troubles. Though why he should take such a gloomy view of the situation is more than I can fathom, since everyone else on board considers that we have made a miraculous escape and are now sure to reach the open sea. I suppose you think it's all right now, doctor, he said as we sat together at dinner. I hope so, I answered. We mustn't be too sure. And yet, uh, no doubt you are right. 
We'll all be in the arms of our own true loves before long, lad, won't we? But we mustn't be too sure. We mustn't be too sure. He sat silent a little, swinging his leg thoughtfully backward and forward. Look here, he continued. It's a dangerous place, this. Even at its best, a treacherous, dangerous place. I have known men cut off very suddenly in a land like this. A slip would do it sometimes, a single slip, and down you go through a crack and only a bubble on the green water to show where it was that you sank. It's a queer thing, he continued with a nervous laugh. But all the years I've been in this country, I never once thought of making a will. Not that I have anything to leave in particular, but still, when a man is exposed to danger, he should have everything arranged and ready. Don't you think so? Certainly, I answered, wondering what on earth he was driving at. He feels better for knowing it's all settled, he went on. Now, if anything should ever befall me, I hope that you will look after things for me. There is very little in the cabin, but such as it is, I should like it to be sold and the money divided in the same proportion as the oil money among the crew. The chronometer I wish you to keep yourself as some slight remembrance of our voyage. Of course, all this is a mere precaution, but I thought I would take the opportunity of speaking to you about it. I suppose I might rely upon you if there were any necessity. Most assuredly, I answered. And since you are taking this step, I may as well— You! You! he interrupted. You're all right! What the devil is the matter with you? There. I didn't mean to get peppery, but I don't like to hear a young fellow— that has hardly begun life speculating about death. Go up on deck and get some fresh air into your lungs instead of talking nonsense in the cabin and encouraging me to do the same. The more I think of this conversation of ours, the less do I like it. Why should the man be settling his affairs at the very time when we seem to be emerging from all danger? There must be some method in his madness. Can it be that he contemplates suicide? I remember that upon one occasion he spoke in a deeply reverent manner of the heinousness of the crime of self-destruction. I shall keep my eye upon him, however, and though I cannot intrude upon the privacy of his cabin, I shall at least make a point of remaining on deck as long as he stays up. Mr. Milne pooh-poohs my fears, and said it is only the skipper's little way. He himself takes a very rosy view of the situation. According to him, we shall be out of the ice by the day after tomorrow. Pass Jan Mayen two days after that, and sight Shetland in little more than a week. I hope he may not be too sanguine. His opinions may be fairly balanced against the gloomy precautions of the captain, for he is an old and experienced seaman, and weighs his words well before uttering them. The long impending catastrophe has come at last. I hardly know what to write about it. The captain is gone. He may come back to us again, alive. But I fear me. I fear me. It is now seven o'clock in the morning of the 19th of September. I have spent the whole night traversing the great ice flow in front of us with a party of seamen in the hope of coming upon some trace of him, but in vain. I shall try to give some account of the circumstances which attended upon his disappearance. Should any one ever chance to read the words which I put down, I trust that they will remember that I do not write from conjecture or from hearsay, but that I, a sane and educated man, am describing accurately what actually occurred before my very eyes. My inferences are my own, but I shall be answerable for the facts. The captain remained in excellent spirits after the conversation which I have recorded. He appeared to be nervous and impatient. However, frequently changing his position and moving his limbs in an aimless way, which is characteristic of him at times, in a quarter of an hour he went upon deck 
seven times, only to descend after a few hurried paces. I followed him each time, for there was something about his face which confirmed my resolution of not letting him out of my sight. He seemed to observe the effect which his movements had produced, for he endeavoured by an overdone hilarity, laughing boisterously at the very smallest of jokes, to quiet my apprehensions. After supper, he went on to the poop once more, and I with him. The night was dark and very still, save for the melancholy sighing of the wind among the spars. A thick cloud was coming up from the northwest, and ragged tentacles which it threw out in front of it were drifting across the face of the moon, which only shone now and again through a rift in the rack. The captain paced rapidly backward and forward, and then, seeing me still dogging him, he came across and hinted that he thought I should be better below, which I need hardly say had the effect of strengthening my resolution to remain on deck. I think he forgot about my presence after this, for he stood silently leaning over the taffrail and peering out across the great desert of snow, part of which lay in shadow, while part glimmered mistily in the moonlight. Several times I could see by his movements that he was referring to his watch, and once he muttered a short sentence, of which I could only catch one word, Ready. I confess to having felt an eerie feeling creeping over me as I watched the loom of his tall figure through the darkness, and noted how completely he fulfilled the idea of a man who was keeping a tryst. A tryst with whom? Some vague perception began to dawn upon me as I pieced one fact with another, but I was utterly unprepared for the sequel. By the sudden intensity of his attitude, I felt that he saw something. I crept up behind him. He was staring with an eager, questioning gaze at what seemed to be a wreath of mist blown swiftly in a line with the ship. It was a dim, nebulous body, devoid of shape, sometimes more, sometimes less apparent as the light fell on it. The moon was dimmed in its brilliancy at the moment by a canopy of thinnest cloud, like the coating of an anemone. Coming, lass. Coming, cried the skipper, in a voice of unfathomable tenderness and compassion, like one who soothes a beloved one by some favor long looked for and as pleasant to bestow as to receive. What followed happened in an instant. I had no power to interfere. He gave one spring to the top of the bulwarks and another which took him on to the ice almost to the feet of the pale, misty figure. He held out his hands as if to clasp it, and so ran into the darkness with outstretched arms and loving words. I still stood rigid and motionless, straining my eyes after his retreating form, until his voice died away in the distance. I never thought to see him again, but... At that moment the moon shone out brilliantly through a chink in the cloudy heaven and illuminated the great field of ice. Then I saw his dark figure, already a very long way off, running with prodigious speed across the frozen plain. That was the last glimpse which we caught of him. Perhaps the last we ever shall. A party was organized to follow him, and I accompanied it, but the men's hearts were not in the work, and nothing was found. Another will be formed within a few hours. I can hardly believe I have not been dreaming or suffering some hideous nightmare as I write these things down. 7.30 p.m. Just returned, dead beat, and utterly tired out from a second unsuccessful search for the captain. The flow is of enormous extent, for though we have traversed at least twenty miles of its surface, there has been no sign of its coming to an end. The frost has been so severe of late that the overlying snow is frozen as hard as granite, 
Otherwise we might have had the footsteps to guide us. The crew are anxious that we should cast off and steam round the floe, and so to the southward, for the ice has opened up during the night, and the sea is visible upon the horizon. They argue that Captain Craigie is certainly dead, and that we are all risking our lives to no purpose by remaining when we have an opportunity of escape. Mr. Milne and I have had the greatest difficulty in persuading them to wait until tomorrow night, and have been compelled to promise that we will not, under any circumstances, delay our departure longer than that. We propose, therefore, to take a few hours' sleep, and then to start upon a final search. September 20th. Evening. I crossed the ice this morning with a party of men exploring the southern part of the flow, while Mr. Milne went off in a northerly direction. We pushed on for ten or twelve miles without seeing a trace of any living thing except a single bird, which fluttered a great way over our heads, and which by its flight I should judge to have been a falcon. The southern extremity of the ice field tapered away into a long, narrow spit which projected out into the sea. When we came to the base of this promontory, the men halted, but I begged them to continue to the extreme end of it, that we might have the satisfaction of knowing that no possible chance had been neglected. We had hardly gone a hundred yards before MacDonald of Peterhead cried out that he saw something in front of us, and began to run. We all caught a glimpse of it, and ran too. At first it was only a vague darkness against the white ice, but as we raced along together it took the shape of a man, and eventually of the man of whom we were in search. He was lying face downward upon the frozen bank. Many little crystals of ice and feathers of snow had drifted on to him as he lay, and sparkled upon his dark seaman's jacket. As we came up, some wandering puff of wind caught these tiny flakes in its vortex, and they whirled up into the air, partially descended again, and then, caught once more in the current, sped rapidly away in the direction of the sea. To my eyes it seemed but a snowdrift, but many of my companions averred that it started up in the shape of a woman, stooped over the corpse, and kissed it and then hurried away across the flow. I have never learned to ridicule any man's opinion, however strange it may seem. Sure it is that Captain Nicholas Craigie had met with no painful end, for there was a bright smile upon his blue, pinched features, and his hands were still outstretched as though grasping at the strange visitor which had summoned him away into the dim world that lies beyond the grave. We buried him the same afternoon, with the ship's ensign around him and a thirty-two-pound shot at his feet. I read the burial service, while the rough sailors wept like children, for there were many who owed much to his kind heart, and who showed now the affection which his strange ways had repelled during his lifetime. He went off the grating with a dull, sullen splash, and as I looked into the green water I saw him go down, 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 until he was but a little flickering patch of white hanging upon the outskirts of eternal darkness. Then even that faded away, and he was gone. There he shall lie, with his secret and his sorrows and his mystery all still buried in his breast, until that great day when the sea shall give up its dead, and Nicholas Craigie come out from among the ice with the smile upon his face and his stiffened arms outstretched in greeting. I pray that his lot may be a happier one in that life than it has been in this. I shall not continue my journal. Our road to home lies plain and clear before us, and the great ice-field will soon be but a remembrance of the past. It will be some time before I get over the shock produced by recent events. When I began this record of our voyage, 
a little thought of how I should be compelled to finish it. I am writing these final words in the lonely cabin, still starting at times, and fancying I hear the quick nervous step of the dead man upon the deck above me. I entered his cabin tonight, as was my duty, to make a list of his effects in order that they might be entered in the official log. All was as it had been upon my previous visit, save that the picture which I have described as having hung at the end of his bed had been cut out of its frame, as with a knife, and was gone. With this last link in the strange chain of evidence, I close my diary of the voyage of the Pole Star. Note by Dr. John McAllister Ray, Sr. I have read over the strange events connected with the death of the captain of the Pole Star as narrated in the journal of my son. That everything occurred exactly as he describes it, I have the fullest confidence, and indeed the most positive certainty, for I know him to be a strong-nerved and unimaginative man, with the strictest regard for veracity. Still, the story is on the face of it so vague and so improbable that I was long opposed to its publication. Within the last few days, however, I have had independent testimony upon this subject which throws a new light upon it. I had run down to Edinburgh to attend a meeting of the British Medical Association when I chanced to come across Dr. P., an old college chum of mine, now practicing at Saltash in Devonshire. Upon my telling him of this experience of my son's, he declared to me that he was familiar with the man, and proceeded, to my no small surprise, to give me a description of him, which tallied remarkably well with that given in the journal, except that he depicted him as a younger man. According to his account, he had been engaged to a young lady of singular beauty, residing upon the Cornish coast. During his absence at sea, his betrothed had died under circumstances of peculiar horror. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this vintage episode of The Captain of the Pole Star by Arthur Conan Doyle. If you've enjoyed this book, please become a supporter by going to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. We'll give you a monthly coupon code as a thank you gift. Thank you for pitching in. Thank you for joining me today and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me next time and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <music>